Paige isn't the only one whose story springboards from the fallout of her coal. Inevitably, things are gonna swing around to Phoebe. Despite having moved on from their relationship, she does grieve the loss as she cries into the pages of her book, because she's on a book tour. You saved our marriage! This guy, I guess, was supposed to look like Cole? The art style had just changed in this issue, and a lot of the dudes tend to blend together, so I was a little confused. From here, we get a lot of introspection from Phoebe concerning her life and her relationships. It's not new for Phoebe to take a little self-siesta, but this time around she is actually using a smidge of self-reflection. Even before I became an empath, I knew that I felt harder than others. She felt so hard and got so far, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. What is good about this section is that Phoebe's grief isn't centered around blaming Cole for all of her problems. She isn't abandoning all of her responsibilities to be selfish either. In fact, she's even willing to push back the first date of her book tour because of a supernatural threat. Granted, it's a threat directly to her, but hey, with Phoebe, I'll take any progress. Yes, Phoebe's character sees a vast improvement in this season. There were times when I even liked her. Outside of the book tour, she barely mentions her column. She doesn't weirdly obsess over anything. Cole saved her husband, so she tries to be nice. Hmm, am I even trying to be the worst lately? Boy, I've really lost my touch. Perhaps motherhood has softened her, an opposite Piper situation. Because hey, remember all of the children? We've got a lot of kids. We really do. In total, there are eight babies, toddlers, and slightly older kids involved here. And you can really sense a tangible annoyance at having to keep track of these children or write them in and out of stories. It's too much. They remain largely off-panel or explained away in a sentence or two. With that being said, I think the choice to strip things back and focus on one or two of the children at a time was very helpful in telling some more intimate stories about parenthood. Rather than seeing an army of strange goblins all around them, there was a connection between the characters. So when Phoebe is on her tour, we get a solid story about her and her daughter PJ. We see her being a good mother, and I actually cared about what was happening. PJ felt like a fully realized character, and not just an extension of Phoebe that was there to annoy me. Also, Piper apologizes for getting knocked out and PJ being in danger? Who the hell is this? You might have noticed the strangest aspect of this season, and that's that the sisters aren't deranged harpies 100% of the time. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, but genuinely, the Halliwells suddenly seem to have some heroic qualities. And like, it's fine to say something bitchy occasionally, I'm not asking for them to be perfect angels, but it is very, very strange to see them actually having empathy. Piper is perhaps the biggest course correction, because she's… almost kind? Leo! Who put the human being potion in my cookies? Uh, well, that was very thoughtful of you. One of my biggest gripes about Piper was just her constant focus on a normal life, to the point of insanity. It's perfectly reasonable for her to want a safe, happy life for her family, but she would constantly blow off saving innocence and bitch at everyone around her about ruining her day. This season does a complete 180 on that. Piper acknowledges her faults and admits she spends too much time prioritizing a normal life over saving people, and finally begins to accept their lives as witches. This is all I wanted, really. She doesn't have to be fully okay with how things are. She can have selfish wants and needs because she's a person. I just wanted to see her care about other people too, and I wanted to see growth and joy. No one has the perfect life. The important thing is to try and find happiness in the life you do have with the people you love. And her growth here ties in with the climax involving Prue. She's even gotten to the point where she and Phoebe can admire Leo's butt together. While I'm commending Piper's development as a character, the same cannot be said for Leo. He's by far the character with the least to do, but honestly, after last season, I'm fine with him taking a bit of a backseat. He didn't even turn into another stupid thing or anything. Anywho, you know who had absolutely the most to do? One Prudence Halliwell. I think they gave up pretty quickly on her asking to be called Pat. I don't even know why they said that. Since she's unable to leave the Nexus, she depends on Cole for assistance. The narration seems to indicate a romantic connection with them at some point, but nothing I read seemed like that. I would call it a mild friendship. And, you know, his soul got destroyed, so that's how that went. 
The Nexus is now a floating castle instead of just the manor again, which I think was a smart decision because A, it's a little confusing to have two manors, and B, that's the most boring choice possible in a comic where you can draw literally anything. It also has much better cell reception than the hotel Phoebe stays at, where you can't even get through to someone when you're right outside. And Prue's arm now has actual stuff drawn on it, not just a bunch of wingdings added in Photoshop. Or Greek letters, I guess. This stuff on her arm, left over from the grimoire and the imperial sword, sent her messages such as, One will die and one will rise. One shall stand, one shall fall. As you can probably imagine, being trapped in a nexus with nobody but a former half-demon limbo ghost lawyer for company can leave you feeling a little bit isolated. On top of that, Prue's sisters seem to be avoiding her and won't tell her why. It's kind of dumb, they just keep hanging up or running out of the room. Even when they lose Cole, they run away without telling her what's happening. There's no reason to keep this secret other than to be a dick. Having all of this time to herself to stew over all of it causes Prue to become pretty bitter about the whole thing. She's angry because she lost her entire life and feels like she's no longer their sister or herself. Because she absorbed the Grimoire and the Imperial Sword, she has magic again, but it doesn't feel the same as Halliwell magic. She doesn't feel like the same person, and she doesn't have her sisters there to ground her. Of course, they dip in to ask for favors every once in a while, but eventually she tells them to fuck off and figure stuff out on their own. She starts actively pushing them away, becoming paranoid that they don't trust her and think she and Cole are in on some sort of alliance against them. I mean, that sounds exactly like them, so I can't really blame her for following that trail of thought. You're some sort of interdimensional being with untold powers inhabiting a coma body in the Nexus of the All? Thanks, Kobama! So what is the actual reason they're avoiding her? It turns out, interacting with her in any sort of way, physical or not, causes them actual pain. But instead of, I don't know, asking one of the guys to say something to her, they just bumble about cryptically and let her be sad. And it is only magical people in their bloodline who are affected, so they could just ask Leo to give her a heads up. Really, everything that happens is their fault. But they do feel bad about it. I mean, Piper was the one with arguably the deepest connection to Prue, and just when she got her sister back, she began to lose her again. But also, she loves ordering Leo around, and she didn't do it this time, so she's dumb. Here's how the font of wisdom that is Grandma Ghost describes the situation. I believe the word you're looking for, Phoebe, is crappy. Her first instinct is to blame a man. Prue absorbed the sword to save Leo, therefore Leo is responsible. Stupid testosterone-filled turd. Oh, so this is my fault now? Has there ever been a life-threatening conflict that wasn't? I think Grams is here. How do you know? The yelling. What follows is a very satisfying moment, where Leo bitches out Grandma Ghost for her dumb shit, and she and Ghost Mom are never seen again. Thus concludes their 10 season arc, I guess. <laughs> they weren't helpful and overstayed their welcome. The end. And the day was saved. <laughs> Desperate for answers, Prue summons Kira by yanking her out of time and saving her from death. You will come to find out that Prue can do literally anything. She thinks a seer might have answers as to what she's become. There have been other seers on the show before, so I'm not sure why she needed to summon one she's never met and doesn't even know out of time, but okay. You might recall Kira's whole thing was wanting to become human, so she says she'll help Prue out if she can do that for her. And they both make good on their promises. So what's the big deal? Turns out Prue isn't inside the Nexus of the All, she is the Nexus of the All. So basically, she's massively overpowered and shouldn't exist. And I guess she could leave after all. Makes it easy! Prue is having a crisis of conscience here. Inside her mind, she finds Patience, who explains that after coming back, hijacking her body, and absorbing all of that power, this is her price. Patience wasn't in her body, but she wasn't gone. Prue violated her and stole her life from her. It's at this moment that Prue has to make a choice. To let go of her new body and move on, or to give in to whatever she's becoming. By destroying what was left of Patience inside her, she begins to slip further and further away. Prue is becoming something bigger than she can control, and subconsciously she's reaching out for the power of three and stripping it away from her sisters. This is explained by a newly human Kira, who tried to live a normal life, quickly found it very boring, and decided she was gonna fight evil. I love her. She's like an opposite Piper, a former demon who longs for a not normal life. Are you saying we have to kill our sister? 
What? No, you crazy murderer! Thus, this brings us to the portion of the season where the sisters try to figure out A, how to be with Prue, and B, save Prue from herself. Piper, who fears no one, bitches at the elders and demands they pitch in because demons have helped them more than the elders have, which is true. As we know, say it with me, the elders are dicks. Keeping with the theme of season 9 plots, but done better, the elders have yet another shift in management. Seeing as how Brody died or moved on or whatever the hell. Seems everyone who makes it to the top of the white lighter food chain can't run things for shit. So yet again, they've decided to start fresh and call the last group a loss. You want to guess what happens to this regime by the end of the season? I don't understand the point of them. I don't. Prue decides to break out Nina and hopes for some answers. Nina has decided to be a woman of color again and will hopefully stay a consistent race. They have, however, temporarily turned Daryl white. What Prue gathers is that she might be able to solve their predicament if she transfers the all to someone else. Phoebe suggests she transfers it to all of them. She is, of course, an idiot. Speaking of idiots, remember Coop's fake hearing that was actually a real hearing? Cupids hate it when you take a bunch of kids over to their temple. Also, I guess they like to remain a neutral party in the battle between good and evil, which I think is a strange position for a bunch of entities themed around love. On top of that, all Coop has ever done is interfere in the battle between good and evil, and his whole point in the show was being a literal trophy sent to Phoebe as a reward for doing good. Here's a stupid giant judge Cupid. If there's one thing Coop is good for this season, however, it's schadenfreude. And man oh man did I drink it all in. <laughs> He gets sentenced to only be able to see Phoebe on their wedding anniversary, which is a double whammy of Phoebe suffering, and I'm very here for it. If the terms of his punishment are violated, the Cupids will strip him and their children of their powers, which doesn't even seem like a thing Cupids can do. Then strip them of their powers. Our family is more important than any of that. I make these decisions. Throw their powers away. The gall, the absolute gall of this woman and her sisters to spend a decade waffling about binding their baby's powers temporarily so they don't summon dragons and murder people. And then the moment Phoebe's dumbass husband ends up in a Cupid prison, she's like, well, how well did they like having powers anyway? Being a Cupid, if Coop is stripped of his powers, he dies. So it's not so much a power stripping sentence as a death sentence. <laughs> Seems like kind of a harsh punishment for bringing his kids to work, but okay. Wow, bonus, let's do it! How do you kill an entity that's technically the ghost of a dead baby anyway? <laughs> Look at Coop being led away in cuffs by a bunch of ghost babies. <laughs> Stupid. And Phoebe's pregnant again, why not? Just, who cares? Who honestly cares? Anyway, now they gotta deal with the new tribunal, which is just the old tribunal with some new guys. So I'd call it an expansion. The tribunal was that group of big floaty heads that created the cleaners and put the charmed ones on trial. Now there's still a bunch of floaty heads, but a big cupid and other dumb creatures are involved. The charmed ones are under the impression this coop situation has sent them straight to the top. But much like the audience, they don't really give two poops about coop. They've convened because the old ones are coming back, and they could be failing to give so many people hexed cupcakes you wouldn't even believe it. I would think that at this point, the Charmed Ones would have a vested interest in stopping the old ones from taking over the world, but apparently they need to be strong-armed into it when Knox comes a calling for that favor from Leo. If they don't help him, Leo dies, but Phoebe does not love Leo more than her book tour. <laughs> I have to go! They're waiting for me! She won't put her life on hold anymore! <laughs> Look, I, I said they were improved. I didn't say they were perfect. Anyway, I said Knox would become a major player, and this video will not make me a liar. I feel like last season they introduced the Knox Academy and then didn't do too much with it outside of making it a magic shelter, which is something they already had anyway. This time around, the fact it's a non-affiliated good or evil school comes into play, but I'm not sure it was really necessary, per se. See, Knox has this whole backstory as to why he's a Futurama neutral, but he made this soul agreement with his old mentor, and now he can't stop him from raising up the old ones inside his students. But because he made another soul agreement with Leo, he can force the Charmed Ones' hands and get them to do it instead. But my question is, why bother with any of this? It would have been the same outcome if he just asked the heroes for help and they were already wanting to stop the old ones after finding out about them from the tribunal. Why force them to help at all? Why have Nox in this bind when he can just ask someone else to do it? 
I appreciated that Knox had this backstory and it made his eventual sacrifice for his students a little more meaningful. I just feel like some of this only serves to eat up pages. Here's where things get interesting. While the old ones are a threat, the real big bad of the season is Prue. She ends up possessed by an old one named Haramis, but this possession is simply the straw that broke the camel's back. She's been slipping away the entire season. And now, all of the anger and resentment that's been bubbling up boils over, and she's looking for revenge. That's right, she's going to destroy Phoebe's column! No, misogyny! Eh, just kidding, she and Zombie Knox are gonna raise the old ones, I guess. This is the season of Prue, and the storm has been a long time coming. The show couldn't address certain things, what with Shannon Doherty being out of the picture, and the last season was kind of a horrifying mess. And the simple fact is, Prue was the best sister. That could just be by default because she didn't have time to become a man-eating shrew. Even as a villain, I find her more likable and sympathetic. I mean, I'd be mad too if my sisters were the charmed ones. Maybe I should have let myself go. Maybe I should have passed on. Maybe I should have become a pitiful ghost like Mom and Grams, popping up with a smile whenever you need help. Whether or not Grandma Ghost and Mom Ghost ever helped is debatable, but she is 100% correct in that they are pitiful. She ain't wrong about any of this. Her dad never came to visit her this whole time. What a jerk ass. He abandoned her again, just like he did when Grandma Ghost pre-Ghost forced him out because she's a man-hating asshole. I mean, because he left his family. What did he even feel about the fact Prue came back from the dead? Was that ever addressed? Everyone sucks here. Prue is on a rampage, and when she arrives at the house, Phoebe just wants her to be a babysitter. Yes, her sister that is the nexus of the all and may or may not be transforming into something no one can control, who hurts anyone magical in their bloodline just being around them. She wants her to babysit. I understand more and more the further I get into Charmed why Phoebe cast a smart spell on herself. It does make it very satisfying when Prue blasts Phoebe's ass into a wall and calls her out for her dumb shit with Cole. This is helping me relieve some of my own resentment toward her, so I'm grateful for it. I think, in a way, Pat Shand knew we needed this. The new tribunal? Your ass is grass! It's kind of hard to feel bad for them when they're torturing a kid for information. Thanks for the truly spectacular bit of nothing you provided. Wait, is Death dead again? There's only one person who can help them now. One man. A man with glazed over eyes who doesn't want to know. Daryl Morris is in the house! Yes, that is correct. Another long plot development is about to be introduced. Daryl has been recruited into the hot new sitcom, Two Ghosts, a Medium, and a Pizza Place. I just want to clarify that's a joke because I realize now that could actually happen in Charmed. The ghosts of Andy and Patience, alongside some lady named Amelia Demo, need Daryl. Amelia will use Daryl, who is a mortal who has only ever seen Prue as her old self, to send the girl's astral selves and Andy into Prue's mind. That's right, Daryl is once again the one to save everyone's asses. This man is about to save the world. You might be wondering who the fuck Amelia Demo is, and you and me both, buddy. This deus ex medium apparently has some sort of troubled history with the Charmed Ones that they never elaborate on. You want to know why? Because her story was told in a novel called Charmed Social Medium, which was never published. Yes, that's right. Everything you need to know is contained in a novel no one can read, so we just have to fill in the gaps ourselves. <laughs> like, what? I could not believe this. Even if this book had been published, what the fuck is this backdoor pilot nonsense? I'm not reading a whole ass novel to know who the hell this is. This is how the entire season and the entire Charmed show is concluded. She is the one who facilitates their getting through to Prue. Who did? Why? And let me tell you, just in her bit here, I don't care. I simply do not care. She smacks of original character do not steal. At the same time, on a positive note, I'm very glad this character's backstory will always be incomplete. This is an extremely charmed thing to do. <laughs> right, uh, the old ones are coming back unless they stop Prue. As Daryl would say, this is an oh man moment. Oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man! <laughs> Stupid floating Daryl head. 
going into Prue's mind works so hard it brings up her old face obscured by hair. You know things are serious when Charmed acknowledges Prue's old face. As the danger subsides and Prue re-emerges, she wonders why she had to die and what the meaning to everything was, and Piper tells her that it's up to them to give meaning to their lives. Prue realizes that she has to make a huge decision in order to do that. During the course of the battle, Paige was mortally wounded, and if Prue dies, the power of three will be reconstituted and, I guess, save Paige somehow. I don't know, just go with it. She asks Piper to kill her with the ancient Athame, making the ultimate sacrifice. Piper weeps into her latest dish at a restaurant, presumably. I did like this ending to Prue's story, at least with the direction they took it in. She couldn't have continued existing as someone else, holding on to something that wasn't there anymore. And while I don't really understand why killing her with the ancient Athame didn't, like, destroy her soul like it supposedly does, or why Patience was magically alive again for that matter, I was happy she was able to move on peacefully. And now she can be a pitiful ghost who watches over her sisters. <laughs> Which brings me to the thing I like the least about this season, and that's Paige's ending. Apparently, being stabbed by the ancient Athame and coming back to life gives you total amnesia. Eh? Isn't that great? Paige has amnesia and is a complete blank slate who doesn't even remember her sisters? And may or may not slowly regain some of her memories via magic later? And now her broken marriage is magically fixed because she doesn't even remember who Henry or her kids are? Isn't that cool? Isn't that fun? Isn't that a great ending for this character? Losing her entire life? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the day, day was saved. saved. <laughs> Look, I hate it. I don't like amnesia endings. I think they're cheap and make you feel like you wasted your time. I think this was a shitty way to treat Paige's character, and I don't like it. Next! Kira and Coldad run the Nox Academy now, even though neither of them have magical powers or teaching credentials. And speaking of being massively underqualified, Piper, Leo, and Coop decide they're gonna form a witch council to replace that useless tribunal. It's time for people who aren't witches to stop pulling witches' strings from afar. Yes, by having their strings pulled by Leo and Coop. Witches! And once again, Prue closes the door. Not to say goodbye, but the end. So, uh, mixed? Very mixed. Overall, I think I liked this season. There were things that didn't make sense, or pissed me off, truthfully, but I really did think they smoothed out a lot of issues I had from before. And to be fair about some of the weaker elements, the length of the season was suddenly shortened, and they had to fit a lot of story into one extra large issue at the end. Characters did make massive improvements, show signs of growth, and Prue and Cole finally got a proper send-off. Prue being the final villain felt satisfying and much more interesting than another random big evil thing. Characters I didn't normally care about were given purpose and distinct voices, and it felt like the season had a plan and a clear execution. Was it perfect? Not by a long shot. But I was pleased with the effort put in not only to conclude the comic series, but the show. It was a million times better than the end of the last season, and a trillion times better than the series finale. I'm glad we went out on this note. Charmed will always be a whirlwind of emotions for me. It's a blend of campy enjoyment, flashes of greatness, insane disappointment, and unbridled anger. In the end, I can say I'm happy I took this journey, however, and I'm happy you all took it with me, Charmanders. And the day was saved. <laughs>